let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. Thank you for joining us. When Roy Hawk of Cleveland, Tennessee and Mabel Thornton of Knoxville, Tennessee first met, a positive letter writing campaign started as the Great War raged in another part of the world. Their relationship and eventual romance would be tested during a difficult time two months after the United States declared war on Germany. Roy and Mabel continued to correspond in a caring, sincere, and regular manner, jotting down everything from fleeting feelings to life commitments to journeys far from eastern Tennessee. My dear Mabel, a grandson's lessons in love, faith, patriotism, and courage from World War I by James Hawk is a collection of their letters, stored undisturbed for over a century from February 1917 to the end of June 1919. At 25, Roy Hawk joined the U.S. Army as a private after winning the heart of a farmer's daughter. A few months later, he was over there in France, serving with the 6th Infantry Division. In contravention of her parents' wishes, Mabel Thornton reported to work as a war worker and clerk in the adjunct adjunct general's office of the War Department at Washington, D.C. at the age of 23. Author James Hawk graduated from law school, practiced law in Washington State, As a Navy brat, James grew up near saltwater ports, including Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, San Francisco, and Seattle. Captain Hawk received orders to head to Naples, Italy during the bicentennial year. James, a scholar of song lyrics from the 1970s, graduated from high school in Naples in 1979, spent his first year of college in Munich, Germany, and one more summer in southern Italy before traveling to Washington State in 1980. James, his wife, and three sons currently reside in Washington State. And James Hawk, author of My Dear Mabel, A Grandson's Lessons in Love, Faith, Patriotism, and Courage from World War I, is our guest on This Week in America. Thank you, Rick. Pleasure to be here. What a really remarkable job you've done in telling this story. The book comes alive, but let's start with how this all began for you. Talk about the the background, your career in law. How did that help you prepare to maybe uh, self-publish these first books? Well, the career in law, I suppose, was helpful in that writing is a big part of the industry and the business. And I left the active practice a few years ago when Seattle was making all of the headlines around the world. And I knew I had this treasure of letters and I knew I had to do something purposeful with that time. And so the practice of law was very helpful and beneficial in the writing. And then when I met these letters, learned the contents, I couldn't just put them back in the shoe boxes, all bundled in twine. I thought I had to write because these letters are remarkable. Well, they really are. In sharing these, this really gives us insight to what was going on during this period of time, what the young people were going through, what uh, uh, a relationship was like back then, the formality of the letters. It's so, when you read back, it's so touching to see the the thoughts that were expressed through all of these letters. And they all come alive in, in James' book, James Hawk, our guest on the program. The author is my uh, the book, My Dear Mabel. Talk about coming up with a, with a book title. It's very descriptive and says it all, but how did you come up with the title? I'll hold up the book cover right now. And they met, as you introduced, Rick, in 1917, the United States was watching the events in Europe, but it had not joined yet. And I won't try to describe the why or the how, because there'll probably be some World War I historians listening in. But at any rate, and because the United States was provoked, she joined that war with all her might in April of 1917. And then my grandfather from a small town called Cleveland, Tennessee, initially described to his new girlfriend, which is probably the right title. All the letters were addressed to Dear Miss Thornton for the first five months. But then, uh, once the heart grew fonder over the course of a year plus, after he'd been through officer training camp, Fort Oglethorpe, and then back to the family business, spent some months in Newport News in the shipbuilding arena, And then he was called, although he didn't have to go, 
Uh, he saw his need to go and sign up as a private in the United States Army. And so he's back down to Fort Oglethorpe. And all those letters from that time, so June of 1918, until his return in June of 1919, were all addressed to my dear Mabel. One after another, he was a creature of habit in many respects, and they conformed to many different writing conventions. But that is how he addressed all the letters. Miss Thorne became dear <laughs> Mabel. And then, My Dear Mabel, dozens and dozens of letters. And the title of the book is My Dear Mabel, A Grandson's Lessons in Love, Faith, Patriotism, and Courage in Letters from World War I. James Hawk is our guest on the program, the author, H-A-W-K. You'll find the book available at Amazon.com. A link for his Amazon page by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Uh, the book is so well written. I want to just touch very briefly on how you found these letters. These were t This was totally unexpected. You weren't searching out for these, were you? That's correct, Rick. When my father passed away, October of 2018, I found these letters among his possessions uh, in the closet and in excellent shape. As I introduce in the book, the reader is invited to be the fourth person in history to read these letters because I'm reasonably sure my dad read a few, but not all. And there are hundreds of letters. The letters committed to this book as you described, only go through Roy's return from World War I. They would not marry until a few days after the anniversary of the armistice, 1921. So they kept writing letters. He stayed to help and form the family business in the small town of Tennessee. And Mabel, the war worker, stayed in Washington, D.C., made sure the 19th Amendment was heading in the right direction and also went to important speeches of the day. She could look down right from her executive office building on the grounds of the White House. So she would see President Wilson come and go. She would see speeches by William Jennings Bryan, other dignitaries, and she would write about it. And then she would go to church and Sunday school every Sunday. But to answer that question, they were found in the closet of uh, my, my father's room uh, when he passed away. He kept them in perfect condition. They were still wrapped in the original twine in the original envelopes. And so I also have that collection of stamps. Because of their unique quality and the way they were preserved, I did correspond with the McClung Historical Foundation or collection that is in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's part of the Knoxville library system. And so all the letters that are in this book. Oh, yes are part of that historical collection, and so they'll be preserved that way. But the reader of this book can see the letters in original form. I, I do have to use liberal ellipsis, otherwise this would be three times as thick. Oh, yes. Some of Roy's letters were 20 pages plus, and so I had to edit generously, but I never disturbed the content or the meaning. I just kept all of the good stuff. You touched on so much there, her reflections on what she's seeing, his reflections and up to 20 page letters that he would write. This book is so touching on and important on so many different levels. It's a great history lesson. It's a great lesson in, in relationships and in faith and patriotism and courage, as you mentioned in the title. The title is My Dear Mabel, A Grandson's Lessons in Love, Faith, Patriotism, and Courage in Letters from World War I by James Hawk, our guest on the program. At what point did you realize, okay, this is not just something of interest to me. This is really something that I need to share. Was there a point when you realized this is much bigger than, than me? I really need to do something so people can, can, can understand what, what was going through the minds of, of the, the countrymen during that time. Yes, thanks, Rick. That point came pretty early, and my, my primary audience uh, was my sons in the original writing time. I have uh, two teenage sons and one who's turning 21 next week, and I thought it important when I found this to share this legacy with them and also impress upon them the importance of writing letters for anyone who wants to learn 
or at least see uh, beautiful letters and how they're written, how one can dedicate themselves to letter writing. Uh, as my preface says, my sons told me originally, nobody writes letters anymore. <laughs> of course, that's not true, but uh, many young people do not write letters and they cannot comprehend the purpose or the skill or the art of good letter writing. So I hope my sons will take a look at that part of why I wrote and believe that writing letters in order to tell people they're important to you, in order to tell people you love them, in order to communicate history and the various purposes. Letters are a good thing. We don't need to communicate always with our thumbs. You know, I double checked. I did not see an emoji or an LOL anywhere in there. These were real old fashioned letters sent between two people with a, a great fondness and a love for each other that's so eloquently shared by James in his books, My Dear Mabel. Explain the, the dedication page. You've done speci something special with that. Let's see. I've not looked at that for a time, so I'll find it right past contents. And while you're doing that, I'll remind people the book is available at Amazon. Very simple to remember. The book is there. Uh, the book is My Dear Mabel by James Hawk. You can go to our website and link on directly to James' Amazon page and order the book there as well. I get information on the book and uh, order it and enjoy it. And it's really a, a piece of history that can be shared with, with your family as well. So I found it. Uh, thanks, Rick. The Dedication, I'll read it verbatim, for Roy and Jimmy, the boys who grew up in the home in vision by Roy and Mabel. And so Roy is my father's older brother. He uh, brought some of those uh, big planes back from World War II. So he was Army slash Air Force, a graduate of the University of Tennessee. And then the Jimmy here is my dad, the, the James Hawk who was the son, the youngest son. So they had two boys uh, when Roy came back from the war. My father was born in 1929. So 1939 is when Roy died. So the last 10 years of his life were the Great Depression and they, they lived uh, during a difficult time for sure. The bottom of the dedication page, I'll read that part, is a quote from Mabel she wrote this in a January 12, 1919 letter. Quote, I know it is going to be the dearest place on earth, end quote. So Roy was saying, I can't wait to get home. We're going to have a home. You and me, we're going to do things right. And we're going to have a loving home, loving Christian home. And this was her response. And in fact, my dad and his brother were probably raised in the dearest place on earth. And there are many of those out there, but they had the courage uh, to write it all down and envision it and then make it happen. That's why this book comes to life and you feel you know the, the characters that uh, James talks about in the book and the letters from these people in My Dear Mabel, book available at, uh, at Amazon. You've also got an author's notes section at the beginning of your book. You really do a nice job in walking us through the background of these people. So by the time we start reading, we really feel we know them at that point. Uh, talk about the, the idea of author's notes. Uh, why did you decide to do that? Thank you. The author's notes is right before another important part titled the preface. And with those two, I inform the reader why I embarked on this book. I give them uh, the historical perspective and my opinion that you don't have to be just from East Tennessee to get the most out of this book. But that is where these protagonists, uh, these real people are from in this book. So the author's notes just give some indication of how I edited. Again, this would have been three times as thick if I put all the content of all oh, the letters yes. in. So all the letters are in here, but they are edited, uh, again, without taking away the meaning or the, the best parts. So the author's notes also say, if you just have to read five of the letters, I give the top five letters of both Roy and Mabel. This book would be a whole lot less interesting if Roy were not an accomplished and beautiful writer. Even though he only finished high school, he was a business owner with his father, and he often wrote a little like Shakespeare 
and a little like Faulkner, at times a little like a guy named Steinbeck. And so he's extremely well-educated yes. man, a man of letters, but without that college degree, he left that for his sons. My father went to law school at the University of Tennessee. Roy married a woman who did not write like writing letters. She was reluctantly brought there. And so she at first said, I don't like writing letters. I'm not going to do it. But then when she saw the importance of her letters, especially when he was in France and a certain group of people were trying to kill him, uh, those letters meant everything to Roy and similarly situated soldiers. So Roy was one of the lucky ones. He got letters every week because Mabel was a dedicated writer and she became a better writer as the reader can see, as the months and years went on. But Roy was a good writer from the start. I did highlight something right at the beginning, March 14, 1917. So it's Dear Miss Thornton again, the first months always to the last name in the salutation. For there is nothing I enjoy more than to sit down and write to my friends. So that's a little insight on who Roy was. <laughs> What a remarkable job. The, the book, it just brings the characters. I keep saying this, but it's so true to life. It's a slice of history. It's a slice of uh, what personal relationships were like during this period. A difficult time in the country, my dear Mabel, by James Hawks, our, our guest on the program. James, talk about what makes this book unique, do you think? It really is different. It should be uh, possibly made into a, a motion picture. I think this has all the elements with the, with the love story, the war in the background. The book really is unique, isn't it? Well, I believe it is. And the content and the setting is so compelling, not just the wonderful East Tennessee part, but again, Mabel being in our nation's capital, when this was all happening, and then Roy being over there with his soldier buddies, uh, the Signal Platoon, 51st Infantry, 6th Division. So I'll just read one part here that, that Babel wrote. Again, this is history being lived and witnessed. She looked right outside her window, right uh, down on yes. Pennsylvania Avenue. And then she boarded with other so-called war workers, and the girls went down. And I used the word girls because that's the term she used. Washington gave one grand celebration for the close of the war Monday night. I don't think Pennsylvania Avenue can relate such a scene in its history again. I am not exaggerating when I say every foot of space was occupied with machines, streetcars, and people. And I think the atmosphere was filled all the way to heaven with praises, horns, and whistles. This is Mabel, the youngest of 14 children. She grew up on a, form, on a farm and lied to her parents. She took the civil service exam so she could go help win the war, and her dad didn't want her to go, but she had to be part of history, I think. It's one of the great sections, one of the more entertaining, as I'm reading the book, one of my favorites, there were many, but I love that because it really comes alive as Washington comes alive during this, during this celebration. How long did it take you to write my dear Mabel, you mentioned going back and, uh, and condensing quite a bit. What was this period like and how long did it take for you to put this book together? Well, I will use a, a lawyer term to explain it at first. There's hundreds of billable hours. But I <laughs> okay. No, no one to bill. It was just my own idea and my own dedication <laughs> of time. I, I found an office space. I didn't do this uh, from a rec room or someplace uh, sloppy. I did it from an office setting. And uh, it took hundreds of hours. So I would say in the many hundreds of hours, once I was done reading the letters, then I had to get them in printed form. Again, they, they went from this format. Uh, this happens to be the poem that accompanied Mabel's letter June 23, 1918, when she met the train in Knoxville. He was on his way to Hoboken, uh, yes. on to Liverpool. But to take those big letters and make them small and manageable letters, uh, that took a lot of time. And I finally discovered the editing feature, part of the Microsoft package. And so that did eventually save me a lot of time in the dictation. And then those had to be edited. And I organize them in chronological order. I'll just read the first 
few chapter titles because I tried to be creative, tried to make it interesting for the reader. Yes. The reader does not pick up the book and just read their edited letters. I give an impression of what they're about. I infuse a whole lot of my knowledge of 1960s and 1970s music lyrics. What a great era. We're so lucky to have lived through that, those of us uh, late baby boomers. So chapter one, Dear Miss Thornton. Chapter two, Winning Affection in Eastern Tennessee. And chapter three, Courting in Cursive. And that kind of <laughs> describes what they were all about in those first months. And then the heart grew fonder and then that distance brought this this love alive. There's a lot of scripture in the book. Roy memorized poetry, the great authors of the day, etc. cetera. So uh, that's a little bit of what's in there. I'm glad you pointed that out. I wanted to make clear that this is not just a collection of you, you found these and then you just had them printed. This is your interpretation. This is you going through your comments. You interject yourself in there. And let's go back to this 1970s popular song lyric uh, uh, fascination that you have because it's fascinating. Someone from that era is sort of leaving that era but still still stuck in that era uh, with with what you've done with that. Talk about that because you do put your own touches. And, uh, the grandson puts his touches on this book as well, doesn't he? Yes, and, and to make the writing exercise fun. Yes. And I, I went to law school and very often I witnessed the law school professor injecting certain things uh, just for his or her own benefit. So just because I'm writing a book doesn't mean I can't have fun too. <laughs> so the reader will see many references to 1970s, 1960s music lyrics. And I write here in the author's notes in a conclusion section the reader should know when going into reading My Dear Mabel that the author has tremendous affection for the lyrics of 1960s and 1970s popular music. And I don't resist using song lyrics, lyrical allusions from the great era of music. So that's part of it as well. I think the reader might find it entertaining and fun. The reader that can spot 90% of these lyrical references uh, would win a prize. They're dozens and dozens of them in here and so someone with the playlist from the 1970s uh, might have the most fun reading this book but the book is for many many different audiences uh, especially one who wants to know about history when these letters were written rick airmail did not exist and people have to realize that all of his letters came oh, home yes. for free it cost her uh, three cents to send each of the letters and what is maybe most remarkable when I did this and assembled everything and organized to write is all of the letters went through. There might have been one or two that fell off the ship somewhere over the Atlantic, but everything went through, including every one of the 42 letters that Roy wrote after the armistice was signed. So he got out of the trenches. He had to go to the hospital with dysentery where he spent Thanksgiving and Christmas of 1918. Every single letter went through, which I just found remarkable. Mabel wrote a Christmas greeting in November of 1918 to Roy in France that caught up to him on Valentine's Day. We take a lot for granted these days. She didn't know that her man was spared until three or four weeks after the war ended. What amazing insight into what life was like then, and you're right. It's so, uh, when we reflect back on that, we understand how far we've come and where we are today in, in so many aspects of society. The time has gone by so quickly. The book is an excellent read on many levels, as we mentioned, My Dear Mabel, A Grandson's Lessons in Love, Faith, Patriotism, and Courage in Letters from World War I by our guest on the program, James M. Hawk, H-A-W-K. The book is available at uh, Amazon. You can go there and uh, check out the uh, the information on the book. Order it there as well. Also, James, I know you, for just a second here at the end, you've been working with Reader's Magnet, uh, worked with them in the big L.A. book festival earlier this year. What's it been like in, uh, in the marketing aspect of the book and working with Reader's Magnet? They've been a tremendous resource, and uh, I'm a neophyte author. I do have uh, larger plans to write some more. I wrote a, a second book called Advice to Sons. Yes. The cover is a postcard that Roy sent to Mabel. 
and it's from my grandfather's letters and my father's letters that I have advice to sons. But uh, Reader's Magnet uh, was very helpful with this My Dear Mabel presentation because the internet is a strange phenomenon for an old school lawyer that didn't have email when I started in practice. So I don't have an IT department either. So they have many resources <laughs> and insights in the marketing. And when I turn my attention to selling more books, then uh, Reader's Magnet will be another go-to resource for me. But I've got a lot to learn in that realm. Well, we appreciate you taking the time and uh, Reader's Magnet for setting up our conversation today with James Hawk, author of My Dear Mabel, A Grandson's Lessons in Love, Faith, Patriotism, and Courage in Letters from World War I. Book available at uh, Amazon, link on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And when Advice to Sons is published, uh, I would love, James, to have you back on the program to talk about that as well. Excellent job with this book. You're a, a very entertaining reader. An excellent job with this. The book is receiving rave reviews. It's just taking off now in the market as well it should. Thank you for joining us on the program. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to having you back with us. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate talking with you. Have a wonderful day in Florida. Uh, and you as well, your last day in Florida as we're taping this on the way back from Seattle from uh, a stopover in Siesta Key, Florida. Our guest is James Hawk. The book, once again, is My Dear Mabel, A Grandson's Lessons in Love, Faith, Patriotism, and Courage in Letters from World War One. Book available at Amazon and, of course, information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And we're back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.